Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another Minnesota Matters. This is our legislative session edition. Uh, I'm Tess Rice, MBA's general counsel. Uh, Teresa Kubas is here. She's our senior government relations manager. And then Carrie Melismon is here. She's associate counsel, and she's going to cover the cannabis law changes. And then uh, Tom Boswell-Healy is here. He doesn't have anything to talk about, but he's here because he knows everything, and we might need him. So uh, this webinar will be recorded, and it will be uploaded into our YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions for us, please put them in the chat. Teresa's going to kick us off with uh, all the inside dirt on the session. Teresa? Sounds great. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, session ended on Monday. So they, um, if you remember, we went back to our first Minnesota Matters back in February. Um, legislative session started on February 12th um, with the constitutional deadline of May 20th to finish up. Um, the question was, were they going to finish early? Could they get it done? Um, the legislature is given 120 legislative days to use in a biennium. So between last year and this year, they had 120 days. Um, the way a day works is if they're on the floor, it counts towards that 120. They went into this session having used 78 days last year. So there was only about 42 days that they could use this year. Um, if you looked at the at April, we had three different breaks for Passover, um, for spring break, Easter. So there was three different breaks. Um, so just kind of looking at the timeline, there was very limited amount of time that they had to work this session. Um, normally, in a second year, if it's a, it's a, you know, it's sometimes considered a supplemental bonding policy year. Um, it's a supplemental budget year if there's a deficit and they really have to balance that budget. But again, there was a, you know, there was a surplus again this year. Um, so getting anything done with appropriations was not necessary. Um, policies is kind of where they were really going to be focused, what additional stuff needed to be done after last year, um, and then another bonding bill. But last year, there was, you know, I think it was a $2 billion bonding bill last year. So again, nothing that needed to be done, but they like to do a bonding bill before an election year. Um, again, reminder, Minnesota one party system. Um, so we have, you know, Tim Walls is the governor, the House um, majority the Democrats control with a 70 to 64 majority. And then the House or the Senate is a 34 to 33. So they had a one seat majority. Um, right before session started, the majority leader, Carrie Dietzik, stepped down as majority leader. Um, she had cancer a couple of years, I think last year, and it came back this year. Um, and so she wasn't going to be at session as much, but so she was a much more remote voter this year. I don't know if I actually saw her in the building at all. Um, but this year, um, so then, so Aaron Murphy ended up being the majority leader. So every vote in the Senate counted. Um, they needed to hold them together. Um, so 11,000 bills. So if you kind of look at the numbers, there was 11,000, over 11,000 bills that were introduced between last session and this session. Every bill is still um, open for debate um, from year to year. Um, and I think I actually pulled up. So this year, just alone, it was 4,300 4, um, bills that were introduced just this year. So over a two-year time period, if you look at the per legislator numbers, there was 55 bills per legislator that were introduced. Um, how session ended, for anybody that watched the end of session, um, this is my 21st year with the, with the MBA, but my 24th session um, in St. Paul. I don't remember it ever ending as chaotic as this year. And especially when you have a one party control who really does control the floor, um, controls what bills are going to be on the floor, kind of the timing of the floor, um, when they're going to be there, what bills are going to come up, when, they gonna, when they're going to recess. Um, so just kind of the chaos that did kind of um, come about at the end of session this year um, was a lot more different than it had been in the past. Um, and if for anybody that watched, there was a, you know, Minnesota has kind of come to see that we have omnibus bills versus um, one, like one single subject bill that kind of goes through. Um, and at the end of session, there was one bill in the last 50 minutes that was passed, no debate, Processes, procedures really didn't, um, weren't followed, and it ended up being a 1,400-page bill 
um, that was passed. Um, and that when I was looking at it, I couldn't even get it to pull up on the on the on my computer that night. Um, you know, so there's going to be blame. There's blame. There's, you know, it's the end of session. Session's wrapped up. We start getting into the session. There's a lot of finger pointing. Um, who is to blame? Is it the Republicans for filibustering on the floor? Is it the Democrats for not, you know, for mismanagement on time up, up and leading up until the last 72 hours? There's going to be a lot of blame. Um, and they're going to, you know, what will end up coming about um, kind of in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm going to have Renee is going to drop into the, into the chat, the political insight. We did send out a political insight on Monday um, that really wrapped up the end of session. Um, Tess and I are going to talk about a bunch of the bills. There will be a legislative summary that comes out um, within the next month or six weeks. Um, and that's going to kind of really go into detail of a lot of the bills that we were following this session. Um, but that political insight will kind of really give you the kind of what happened that those last um, 72 hours. And also in that link, there's all the other political insights from the rest of session as well. Um, so if you really look at the end of session, kind of what ended up breaking down that last, um, as I said, there's a 34 to 33 majority in the Senate. Um, there were two big circumstances that really did impact that last month of session. Um, over the Passover break, there was a state senator from Woodbury that was um, arrested up in Detroit Lakes um, for um, attempted burglary um, of her stepmom's house. And that did um, call into question a lot of discussion on the floor as to should she be voting um, and the ethics. And it was just kind of like, this is a one, you know, a one vote majority. And so it was just, it was, it was a lot of time um, that was spent on the floor um, trying to figure out whether she should be voting. And that was the one deciding vote on a lot of things. So the Republicans will say, you know, you're holding um, one, one, you know, one Senator who, um, didn't do the best things um, when it came to um, judgment, um, as a lot of people will will say. But instead of working with Republicans to find some bipartisan um, bills to kind of cross to get over the finish line, so the question was, are you really looking at what's best for Minnesotans? Um, and so there's, you know, again, I'm trying not to be partisan, just kind of in, in nature. But there was a lot going on when it came to that situation. Um, the other one was in, um, you know, Minneapolis passed the Uber Lyft bill. Um, and then had that ordinance in place, which was going to have Uber and Lyft leaving um, July 1st. That spent a lot of time. There was obviously one senator that was working on the TNC bill, um, the Uber Lyft bill. And on Saturday, he went missing for 12 hours. Um, and so they, the Senate was in recess for 12 hours on Saturday because they couldn't take votes. And when you need one vote, um, he was not there. And then it came about, I think, at 10 o'clock on Saturday night that there was an agreement with Uber and Lyft. Um, but that bill was also then put into the that very large omnibus bill. Um, but as kind of looking at the omnibus bills, you know, I, you know, this session, I think when all said and done, they only passed 47 bills. Um, in over the biennium, 122 bills. And I, I compare it to the last time there was a one party control, which was back in the um, 2013, 2014 years, um, when we had, you know, again, one party with um, Mark Dayton as governor. That time around, there was 312 bills that were passed in that biennium. So you look at 312 bills 10 years ago versus 122 bills this time. I mean, if you really look at a lot of people when they were having those discussions as to what, you know, they, you know, getting as many bills passed in a one party, um, one party makeup is, a, you know, it's, it's easier to do and you can kind of get everything through. What we found and a lot of it, would, you know, is omnibus bills. You know, if you look at, you know, if you look at the political insight, you know, if you look at the commerce policy bill, you know, the house puts in, in, you know, a bunch of bills that they want. The Senate puts in a bunch of bills and they're not always necessarily matched up. And then they, you know, they use them as leverage. Sometimes a bill is never heard um, in the Senate, but it'll be in the House bill. And, you know, just by, you know, nature of it being a priority for one, for one um, body, they end up taking it in the other one. Um, so, you look at those 11,000 bills and, you know, only 122 passing in this um 
in this biennium, a lot of them were in these omnibus bills because these omnibus bills were large. The commerce policy omnibus bill, I think, was probably about 150, 160 pages as well. Um, so there were two commerce bills that we were watching. There was the commerce policy omnibus bill. Um, that one came out. So that one really didn't have any appropriations. But then there was the commerce finance appropriations. They were given a very small appropriation, um, but they did have some policy stuff in there. And I'll go into one of those policy items in there. Um, but then, but just kind of looking at the flow, uh, I, the number of times that I either talk with ABA or with members um, to try and figure out where bills are because of, you know, a lot of bill tracking systems are out there and you can plug in one number and you'll see the kind of how it tracks along the way. Well, when you shove a bill into an omnibus bill, it looks like the bill may end up dying. Um, so a lot of people just don't know with Minnesota as to where the bill ends up in the process. The Commerce Finance Appropriation Bill, um, that one started off in the Commerce Committee and it ended up being just a Commerce Finance Bill. It ended up going to Ways and Means and Finance, so Ways and Means in the House and Finance in the Senate. And in those ones, they then put them into larger bills. So then they combined an agriculture, uh, energy and climate, and commerce finance in that one, um, in both of them, so that they matched up. And then to continue watching during session, um, when they went to conference committee, the question was, there were a lot of problematic energy provisions. Was there going to be an omnibus energy bill? So Zach Stevenson, who was the chair of the Commerce um, Committee in the House, took the Commerce provisions out of that conference committee and moved them to the cannabis. So he was also the author of the cannabis uh, bill. So the, cam the cannabis conference committee was meeting. And so they got approval from leadership to move the commerce provisions over to the cannabis. So in the end, the commerce finance provisions ended up in the cannabis bill, and that's where they ended up passing. So I'm going to touch on a couple bills um, and just kind of some of the process that the MBA, you know, we, you know, we end up in so many different committees um, and just bills that we end up seeing can end up going from, you know, health and human services to housing to judiciary. Um, I think, you know, energy, there's, you know, you know, education, there's so many different um committees that we do sit in, um, but there's three bills. So I'm going to kind of touch on a couple of them. And then when I kind of give kind of some of the high level background, Tess is going to jump in and do um, some of the details on it. Um, but as I was saying, in the commerce finance um, appropriations bill that ended up in cannabis, um, one of the very big provisions in there was the consumer data privacy bill. Um, this bill was brought up by Representative Elkins. If you go back to our legislative summaries, I think we've probably talked about it in the last couple of legislative summaries at the end of session as to bills that did not pass. Um, so Representative Elkins first dropped the bill in, uh, it was May of 2019. So we were kind of made aware of um, it was right after California had passed theirs. Um, and then some of the states started to look at these consumer data privacy bills. Um, and we we met with them. I, I, I'd like to say we met with him on Halloween in 2019 was the first time we met with him in person to really talk about the consumer data privacy. We talked about Graham Leach Bliley and need, the need for an exemption. Um, but, if, you know, we kept meeting with him over the years. And as the bill never passed in Minnesota, more so because there was, you know, divided government. So the Republicans um, kind of didn't do as much with that one. But we kind of always talked about let, if we can find a consensus that the business community and, and Elkins and everybody could agree to, we're probably better off having something in law um, than to not have something that we don't like or to have something that we don't like. So we were really focused on the Graham Leach Bliley and Tesla will kind of talk about, you know, kind of who was really impacted um, along the way. Um, but a lot of states that were passing it, I think there was 12 up at up to the point this year um, that had already passed it. And a lot of them were really Graham Leach Bliley entity level. When Elkins really started it, it was an information level Graham Leach Bliley exemption. Um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of our members wanted a entity level exemption, which was what was getting put in in a lot of states. Um, but having the conversation with Representative Elkins, who really prided himself on being an expert at this point on this bill and on this topic, really didn't want to do an entity level exemption. So we really kind of had to go back and forth with him. Um, and every time we thought we had made made inroads with him, he had changed he had changed the goalposts. And there was a different situation and a different circumstance that we were trying to impact, which was 
you know, like who was going, you know, like who was using Graham Leach Bliley as an exemption. And, you know, a lot of times we kept saying, we're like, nobody would use Graham Leach Bliley unless they were following it. And that you couldn't take a Graham Leach Bliley exemption unless you were actually following. And so there was a lot of conversations about what was really kind of in there, but he ended up taking a different approach from the majority of states. Um, but in the end, we got to an agreement with him and we're really happy with where we ended up. And um, that one did pass this year and I'll pass it to Tess to give a little bit more. So this bill really concerned us because um, there's a lot in there about consumers having rights to their data and just kind of an operational uh, nightmare for businesses. So a co consumer would have the right to know and access personal data, right to correct inaccurate personal data, right to delete personal data. That was one we really um, pointed out that a bank can't delete data that we have about a customer. We can't delete that you use the ATM, things like that. Um, right to obtain a copy of their personal data, right to opt out of the processing of their per personal data for advertising the sale of their data. Um, they have the right to review, understand, question, and correct how their personal data has been profiled. So it was really important to us to try to get banks out of this thing. Um, it applies to businesses that are conducting business in Minnesota, so they don't have to be um, organized in Minnesota, um, or producing products or services targeting Minnesota residents that that control or process personal data of 100,000 consumers or more, or derive over 25% of their gross revenue from the sale of personal data. Um, so um, the exclusion that Teresa mentioned we were able to get is that this chapter, so the whole chapter on data privacy does not apply to a state or federally charted bank or credit union or their affiliate or subsidiary that's prim principally engaged in financial activities. So um, we, we were pretty happy with that. Um, so there's no private right of action as well. We were very concerned that there would be a lot of um, consumers and consumer lawyers suing. Um, and so it's only the attorney general that has the sole authority to enforce the act. And it looks like they appropriated um, 1.6 million over the 26 and 27 to pay for the enforcement. Sounds good. Thank you. And then another one that we really kind of popped up this year, we kind of, and I went back to my, my MBA news article prior to session as to kind of what topics in the first legislative, um, the first political insight, kind of what topics we were going to be looking at this year. And I think I was pretty spot on with what we were looking at, but there's always other things that pop up along the way. Um, one of the topics that we were looking at this year um, we had gotten, you know, it was the medical debt um, discussion. We had heard at the end of last year um, that there were some groups that were talking about medical debt um, and kind of, you know, people that were getting hit with medical debt and the impact of medical debt. And it was obviously not debt that they wanted. Um, and so, you know, nobody likes medical debt. And so the conversation really focused, a lot of the press conferences really focused on medical debt and, you know, the words medical debt, medical debt. But when we, you know, right before session started, or maybe right at the beginning of session, we had not seen any language as to what this bill might look like. And a lot, and it was coming from the attorney general's office. And the attorney general's office was the one that was really working on this. We were called into a, I think it was a Friday late afternoon meeting. We had give, we, we had, we were given the 24 hours, I think before that, a list of 26 bullet points as to what was going to be in this bill. Um, and it was medical debt. It was garnishment. It was, you know, bankruptcy. It was, it was a lot more sweeping than um, medical debt. And, you know, just some of those high level points, you know, it was, if you had less than 5,000 in your, in your bank account, you could, it would never be garnished. You know, all of the fees that banks were able to kind of, you know, get during garnishment, that was going to be, that was going to be gone. Um, it was, you know, there was just, you know, there was joint ownership. Like there was just, there was a lot of items in there that would make garnishment nearly impossible to do. Um, so we were then called into a meeting on Friday, on that Friday afternoon, and A.G. Ellison was on the call and they gave a high level. And then he's like, and we'd like to hear your concerns. And we all, I think everybody on the call said, well, we appreciate have, having the call, 
but nobody had seen the language. So nobody can respond to, you know, to 26 bullet points without actually seeing language. Um, quickly after that, we got language um, and we had another call with um, the AG's office and proponents because the, you know, the way that we normally work up at the legislature, if you really want to pass, if you actually want to pass good policy, everybody really kind of tries to work together. You kind of have those conversations. A lot of times it's done months and months ahead of time, um, kind of really going back and forth to see what is workable. Um, but that has just really not been the case the last couple of years. And we've found that it's been harder. Um, legal aid was part of this conversation as well. Um, we have a great relationship with legal aid. And there was a lot of frustrations that, you know, that we couldn't have those conversations because you know it was really being you know brought to, to everybody by the AG's office and people weren't given permission to kind of have those conversations. Um, another call right after the bill came out, the language came out, we had a call with the AG's office and he walked through the bill. And when it got, and I, the one of the things that was just very, it, it was very telling as to kind of where we were with this bill and where we would have to go with it, was when the staffer for the AG's office, when he got time to talk about those garnishment fees um, that financial institutions were able to collect, um, the, the AG's person called them screw you fees, um, kind of really taking it as a junk, you know, kind of, you know, that tagline of junk fees. It was, you know, that, and his comment was, when it comes to garnishment, banks just push a button and that's how garnishments happen. And we pushed back on that. Um, Tess and, you know, and our off, and, you know, and everybody in the office kind of really pulled together. We reached out to all of our members. Um, we got a lot of feedback, kind of what the process looks like. You know, Tess talking about the, you know, the trainings we do, the, the hand, you know, all the handbook stuff, all the, the flow charts. Um, just kind of really having those conversations, and the MBA led the meetings with both of our with both of the authors in the House and the Senate. We sat down with those authors. We really walked through what what you know what it, what it takes to go into these into a garnishment, um, and really had those really good conversations. Um, and so it, a lot of the a lot of the really bad parts of the garnishment side of things were removed fairly quickly. Um, and I think we were really at the end down to that threshold, 5,000, 4,000 out in the Senate, back in 2,500. Um, we were at the table at every meeting. We were the, you know, we were the only banking association that was in those, in those meetings. It was early mornings on Friday mornings, Monday mornings, Zoom calls, we were at the table with the AG's office, the authors, the collectors, um, the the hospitals were there. Um, our contract lobbyists are phenomenal and they had a couple of clients in it and they were you know, front line on all of that. They were great advocates for us as well. Um, so we were very pleased with the result that came from this part of it. Um, and so I will hand it over to Tess to kind of talk a little bit more about it, but, you know, at, in the end, it was, the, the process was sloppy, but the results were great for us. <laughs> That's a good summary. So, uh, what actually ended up passing is there's a new chapter on collection of medical debt. Um, they would have liked us to be subject to that, but we were able to, um, get a provision in there that, you know, banks don't collect medical debt per se. Um, but if you're complying with a court order or, processing a garnishment or levy, um, you're not subject to that chapter. So I don't think it's anything that we have to be concerned about. Um, there's going to be some changes in the garnishment process. If creditors receive an exemption claim from a debtor, um, they have to either release the money or they have to interpose an objection in the district court. So uh, it's a little bit different process. Um, they updated the bankruptcy exemptions. There's a new wildcard exemption for bankruptcy of 1500. Um, so that could apply to a bank account. So a customer could say, um, this is exempt in my bank account. Um, but that should be, you know, through their bankruptcy attorney. Um, they updated some of the amounts of things like jewelry and, you know, they have um, like sacred possessions, that's Bibles and things like that. Um, they have uh, made 
$10,000 is the new vehicle exemption. So if you have declared bankruptcy and you have a vehicle worth less than 10,000, you can keep it. Uh, that goes up to 100,000 for a vehicle accommodated, designed to accommodate a disability. Um, one big change was that uh, a spouse now will not be liable to a creditor for medical debts of the other spouse. It turns out a lot of states have that provision and Minnesota didn't. Um, so that's a big deal. And then the um, income tiers for wage garnishments were changed um, so that the more money a person makes, I guess the, the higher their the higher percentage they're gonna have to pay of their weekly income towards a garnishment. And then finally, we are gonna work on these garnishment forms. The legislation directs the attorney general to revise the garnishment forms and then gain approval from 10 business groups, including uh, the MBA. So we will be working with them to um, hopefully improve and update those forms. Right. And one part of the of the medical debt as well was um, they were taught, you know, whether credit cards was going to get looped in. So there's some credit card language as well um, that because, you know, a lot of it was that, you know, how you could collect debt. And the question was, you know, like if you put medical debt on a credit card, we couldn't separate out on a credit card kind of medical debt versus credit card debt. Um, so I don't know if there's anything on that one, Tess, that you want to mention. Um, I did not include that in here. I, there's only a couple banks that have credit cards that are specifically for medical debt. And so uh, those banks know what they have to do now. But yeah, I know that we worked on that quite a bit. Yeah, because that was one of the things at the beginning there was like, you couldn't charge interest on medical debt. And the question was, how was medical debt, you know, medical debt on credit cards and um, so making sure the credit cards were removed. So now the only credit cards that really are impacted are credit cards that are offered within um, in medical offices and that are solely medical um, focused. Um, one other thing that I'm going to mention is just kind of, in, and then I'll hand it over to Tess to do, and maybe I'll jump in when um, Tess is talking about some of the other issues. Um, it's just kind of the conversation about swipe fees. And I'll, you know, there was a couple bills. There was a a junk fees bill and Tess can talk, and you know, we'll have a, some more information on that one. But then there was also a, a bill in the labor policy committee. Um, and it, it doesn't impact us as much as it just the conversations around it in the labor policy omnibus bill. Um, the conversation was around tipped employees. And if you're working at a restaurant and you are receiving a tip. So if you are a server and you're receiving a tip, apparently there are situations where the the employee is only getting, if the tip is paid for on the credit card, the employee is only receiving um, the tip minus the 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 fee. So they that the um, the employer is removing the interchange swipe fee um, from the gratuity. Um, so they put into the into the labor policy um, that you had to, that if somebody pays for a tip that they get the full tip. And so it's in those conversations. There's a lot of com there's a lot of hospitality groups which we're normally we work with quite well. Um, but they a lot of them have those conversations about the interchange fee. And so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised that we do continue to have conversations. I know the Congress is looking at it quite a bit, um, but that if it does get to another uh, a state level, just in whether they try and attempt to do anything or not, it comes up when they when they talk about a lot of the mandates that are being placed on businesses and just the cost of doing business. And so we were we watched those because banks, and the chart and the fees that are charged when it comes to credit cards are always brought up um, in those conversations. And those are just ones that we just kind of watch and we kind of cringe and we're like, let's just not talk about credit cards and let's just kind of move on to a different one. But those, you know, that's kind of one of those things where it comes up, but it, you know, it doesn't impact us, but it does impact us because it's obviously um, thoughts that are in a lot of legislators' heads, which can become legislation down the road. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Tess and she can talk some more details on other bills. Okay, so there was a bill that actually passed really easily with bipartisan support that was um, updates to the Uniform Commercial Code to accommodate emerging technologies. This is um, this is a uniform bill that's passed in many states and um, it will accommodate things like the electronic signatures now and also kind of give some guidelines for um, dealing with digital assets, especially when um, 
a bank might take a digital asset as collateral. So how to collateralize it um, and it deals with all the priority issues. Um, so I think that one's going to be really helpful. Um, that one's effective August 1st, but there are some transition um, rules uh, for loans that might already be out there that are secured by these digital assets. I'm hoping that we can get out some more uh, information, maybe do some education on um, that one, because there's, there's a lot there, I think. Um, there were some amendments to the coerced debt bill that passed last year. That's um, situations where someone is coerced into taking out debt. Um, and uh, legislation last year protects the people, the victims of that, and um, has procedures for banks to forgive that debt for that victim, and then to be able to pursue the actual um, bad actor in that situation. Um, we worked with legal aid to um, make some changes that we like into there. They removed the term harassment, for example. Um, and then they created some additional notice and service requirements. And then there's a presumption that the debtor has incurred coerced debt if the person alleged to have caused the debtor to incur the course debt has been convicted or received a stay of adjudication of several crimes. So um, just a little changes there. Um, the junk fees bill, Teresa was mentioning, um, we worked really hard to try to get banks out of that one completely. We weren't able to do that, but what it does is um, it prohibits a person from advertising or offering a price for goods or services that don't include all of the mandatory fees or surcharges. Um, so um, a mandatory fee is one that has to be paid in order to purchase the goods or services being advertised that are not reasonably avoidable by the consumer or that a reasonable person would expect to be included in the purchase of the goods or services being advertised. So obviously that's kind of mushy language that we don't love. Um, and there is some language in there that says that um, if federal law, I can't remember how it says, um, if there is a federal law that governs that, um, if, if something conflicts, then, then it would be preempted, but it isn't really strong enough language for us. Um, there is an existing statute, however, that says that, um, that this new statute doesn't apply to conduct in compliance with the orders or rules of a statute administered by a federal, state, or local government agency. Um, and there's also a specific exemption for RESPA services. So um, I think that with all of those things together, um, banks should be okay since uh, all our advertising rules are pretty specific in um, DD and Reg Z. Um, so I think it'll be okay. Um, if if not, I, you know, we may have to go back and, and try again. There are a lot of industries that would like to be exempt from that. Um, the Department of Commerce has a technical policy bill um, they changed their statute 4720 to increase the threshold. No one was using that because the th max threshold in that was 100,000 for a mortgage. Um, now they've increased it to the FHFA threshold, which I think is like around 700,000. Um, but if you continue to make your loans under 4759, which most banks do, then this will not impact you. Um, there is uh, rules about virtual currency kiosks. So kind of little ATMs for people with virtual currency. Um, it's all consumer protection things. Um, there's amendments to the transfer and death deed laws that has to do with mortgages where people uh, file a transfer on death deed so that when they pass away, the house will automatically, automatically be deeded to uh, the beneficiary. Um, they had run into some problems with insurance not covering situations um, between the time that the person passes. And um, there was some gap there. And, and I think that there was maybe a fire or something and insurance didn't cover it. So this is going to have insurance cover that property over um, that transition period where the property is transferred to the beneficiary. So that's good. Um, there's some changes to commercial pace. Some of your customers, um, commercial customers probably get pace loans. Um, they're widening the scope of this to include um, water improvements and uh, resiliency improvements. So that would be like um, structural integrity, for earthquakes, indoor air quality, uh, resistance to wire, uh, wind, fire, and flooding, things like that. So you may see um, more different types of PACE loans. Uh, 
Last session, MBA was able to negotiate a lender notice and consent requirement for commercial PACE, which was very important because uh, a bank that has a customer that wants to get one of these PACE loans, um, the bank has to agree to it before the customer can get this PACE loan. Um, there's a non-bank data security law, um, so which is kind of nice. So now um, your competitors that are not banks uh, will have to follow some data security laws. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, Teresa, or not Teresa, but Carrie's going to cover um, the cannabis legislation that passed this year. So we'll do that, and then we'll finish up with uh, Teresa talking about um, the upcoming elections. Great, Carrie. thanks, Tess. Um, we'll talk about the session's changes to the cannabis laws. The changes focus on social equity, applicants, uh, early cultivation, medical cannabis, and licensing. Notable provisions in this year's cannabis bill give social equity applicants a head start on their competitors by making them eligible for pre-approval of their licensing or their license and giving some of them the ability to start cultivating cannabis plants early. The goal is for the social equity applicants to start selling their product as soon as the first retail stores open, which could be as early as next spring, at a time where traditional applicants will still be getting their businesses set up. Uh, and in July, uh, the Office of Cannabis Management must start verifying that social equity applicants meet the legal criteria for people from groups harmed by the cannabis prohibition. The application period for pre-approval will run from July 24th through August 12th. And depending on the number of applicants and how much time the OCM needs to verify each applicant's ability to fund and launch their business, the first lottery could be held as early as this fall for the licensing. Another change is a new method to give some social equity license applicants permission to start growing cannabis sooner, which again could be as early as this fall. Sales, however, will not be able to start until the permanent rules for recreational cannabis uh, are finalized, which will be probably early 2025. Uh, veterans were added to the pool of Minnesotans eligible to be considered social equity applicants. Previously, the only military members Able to apply were disabled veterans and current and former National Guard members and veterans who had lost their honorable status due to a cannabis offense. And then people who have been previously convicted of cannabis offenses, who have had met family members convicted of cannabis offenses, or who live in disadvantaged areas are also eligible for social equity license. The bill also include included major changes to eligibility rules for medical cannabis patients. Previously, only patients with specific conditions such as can cancer, HIV, AIDS, glaucoma were eligible for medical cannabis. Now patients can get it for any condition a phys physician recommends it for. Um, other changes passed this year are largely in line with the requests made by the Office of Cannabis Management. They include transferring enforcement of at a edible cannabis products to the OCM, and that takes place this summer. Caps on the number of licenses given out to cultivators, manufacturers, and retailers. Licensing by a random lottery system uh, rather than the points-based system that they originally uh, were considering. Exemption to license limits for cities and towns seeking to open municipal cannabis stores. And then finally, uh, allowing bars to sell both THC and alcoholic beverages to the same person, provided that that person is not visibly intoxicated. There were other changes impacting lower potency hemp edibles, medical cannabis, and recreational adult cannabis, including many technical changes. So this all is going to give the OCM a lot of work to do in the rulemaking process. And then finally, I just want to let you all know that we have two cannabis web webinars coming up. Uh, the first is going to be on June 18th, uh, Navigating Compliance for Non-Cannabis Banks from 1230 to 230. So if you're choosing not to bank cannabis, this would be a good, great webinar for you to attend. And then on July 25th, we have a cannabis banking uh, in Minnesota from 10 to 11. And then you can visit our, our website to register. So I will turn that back to Teresa, I believe. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Um, 
So looking at this year, so we have 19 retirements. So at the end of session, um, we had 19 retirements that we know of for sure. Um, so starting on Tuesday, filing has opened. So this coming November, um, there are no there there are not supposed to be any state senators on the ballot. Um, and it would just be the Minnesota House um, if you're looking at kind of the local elections. So the Minnesota House is up for re-election. So all 134 of them are up for election. Um, so 19 um, have already decided to retire, one of them being Representative Brian Farr, um, who is a banker um, from the LeSueur area. He has um, gotten a promotion with his bank and will no longer be in office. So that will be a huge loss to um, to the MBA and to the legislature. Um, he was definitely a big role in a couple of the bills that we've passed in the last couple of years. Um, when it came to the garnishment stuff, he really, you know, he was talking to the legislators as well. What is, you know, what their process is for garnishment. Last year when we did the climate risk disclosure survey, um, again, he was very um, important in those conversations. So we will definitely miss him. Um, there might be a special election when it comes to the Senate, to the state Senate, um, one being possibly that Woodbury seat. Um, it is unknown as to what will happen um, with that seat um, and that legislator. Um, but the other one that's possible is the Orono, Minnetonka area, um, Lake Minnetonka, um, Tonka Bay. It's the um, Kelly Morrison is running for Dean Phillips seat in um, the third congressional district. And if she um, decides in the next couple of days um, to step down and resign to run for that seat, um, since it's a very high likelihood she will win the third congressional district, um, it would be better for um for some that think that it's better to have that seat on the general election in November, um, if she misses the timeline, then it ends up becoming a special election um, outside of the general election. Um, but again, that that is a seat that would be incredibly expensive because that one would be a deciding vote for the majority in the Senate. Um, she is obviously a DFLer, um, so that would be a thirty. You know, so it would put them back at thirty three, thirty three, um, going into next year and not knowing um, kind of what that that makeup that is. Um, so that one we will, I, we believe she will resign. Um, we have not seen anything yet. Um, but again, on Tuesday, um, filings open for office. Um, the primary is August 13th this year. The general is November 5th. Um, so what the legislature will look like next year is unknown. Um, we do know that they will not be in the state office building. They have until Friday to move out of the state office building into the Centennial building. Um, as the state office building is going to be under renovations for at least the next two years, um, possibly longer, depending on how long it takes. That that will be an issue that will probably be discussed quite a bit during the election as the expense of the state office building has grown to $750 million. Um, and a lot of people like to um mentioned that when the state when the Senate office building was built, you know, 10 years ago or so, it was 90 million and the renovations for the state capital were about 350 million. Um, so a state office building $750 million renovation um, is kind of expensive. Um, so just kind of looking ahead, we are we will be watching the elections. We will have the legislative summary out in the next month or so, um, which will have much more detail. Um, we'll have more on kind of some of the employment stuff because in that 1,400 1, page bill, there was some changes to the paid family medical leave um, act as well. And so we'll have some information on that, on misclassifications and what that means when it comes to independent expenditure and how you are expenditure, independent contractors, um, I'm already in election mode. Um, so there'll be more information also on the taxes and what passed, which was really small this year. Um, but we'll have much more detail in the legislative summary. Tess, anything else? Otherwise, we are all wrapped up. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Shoot us an email if there's something you want us to cover in our next um, Minnesota Matters. Okay. Have a great day. Bye.